It is early in the 1780s, and a rugged territory, long known to scouts and surveyors, is attracting increasing numbers of settlers from the east. Along the wilderness road they come, families with their animal, they trudge northwest. Behind them, the struggles of the Revolutionary War. Before them, the conquest of a wilderness. The journey is long and arduous, but it leads to a land of promise. And for Walter Taylor and his friend George Simmons, that is enough. These men have fought for freedom. They intend to make it real. A purpose fully shared by Mrs. Taylor and Mrs. Simmons, women of dauntless courage. Day after day, the party follows the unfamiliar trail, sometimes crossing the beds of streams carved through Kentucky limestone, streams bordered by forests of cherry, walnut, hickory, and oak. And there's many a hill to climb in the course of the weeks of travel. Streams, hills, and forests, the trail of the wilderness road. And more than physical hardship lies along the way. Here, Taylor and Simmons catch sight of grim reminders of a kind of danger. An overturned and abandoned kettle means but one thing, Indians. Nearby is further evidence of the swift and tragic raid, a woman's shoe and a child's bonnet. Not all who travel the wilderness road survive. But the fate that has fallen to others does not discourage these determined pioneers. They salvage the abandoned kettle and press on, knowing well the danger that surrounds them, but feeling a confidence born of courage. So the long days pass on the march, while the evenings bring pauses for the night in camps beside the trail. Finally, several days later, the party have reached the bluegrass country. Not far away is their destination, a fort called Harrod Station. Since 1775, an outpost of the frontier. Here, keen-eyed sentries keep a constant watch, ever on the lookout for signs of hostile Indians. Within the fort enclosure lives a small community of settlers, some of them permanent residents, others temporary visitors, all of them busily engaged with the tasks of the frontier. Now from his post, the sentry catches sight of the group of new arrivals. They will be more than welcome here at Harrod Station. Newcomers to the frontier mean so many more strong arms skilled in the use of rifles, so many more stout hearts to aid in the winning of a wilderness. And to the travelers, arrival at the fort means the often dreamed of end of a long, wearisome and dangerous journey. Little wonder that there is rejoicing all around as fort dwellers and newcomers greet each other. The people of the fort community know all too well what the long trek from Virginia has meant. They too came over the wilderness road not so long ago. A common purpose, a common faith unites the pioneers. During their stay at the fort, the Taylors share the cabin of the Carters, friends known in Virginia. Household tasks are likewise shared. And as Mrs. Carter tends her baby boy, Mrs. Taylor busies herself with the cooking, while little Mary Carter winds balls of rags for weaving. At the Fort Spring, Ruth Taylor fills a wooden water bucket. Nearby, her brother John milks the family cow, kept inside the Fort enclosure, along with other members of the Fort's animal population, highly prized possessions of the little frontier community. So life at the fort goes on, with tasks for each and for all. Lye from wood ashes is laboriously stirred into an iron kettle of boiling animal fat. Thus is prepared the soap that is needed for laundering clothes and for other household uses. At the shop of the fort carpenter, Walter Taylor's host, Mr. Carter, is showing him the tools he can obtain here to equip himself for farming. A good strong plow, shaped by the carpenter's skillful hands, hands now engaged in fashioning household furniture. 
A broad axe will be needed for hewing the timbers for floors, for tables, and for benches. Yes, the carpenter, just now completing a stool for a fort household, can readily supply a number of tailor's needs. He has helped equip many a frontiersman. Now to locate Taylor's farm site. We'll take old Jim Bradley with us. He knows this territory better than any man in the fort. How's the land around here, Mr. Bradley? Well, now I'll just tell you. If a man plants his land in corn and takes good care of it, he'll get a hundred bushels to the acre. With middling care, he'll get 75, and if he don't plant at all, he'll still get 50. <laughs> they say at the fort that sometimes Jim Bradley does exaggerate just a little. But he scouted this territory years ago, and he knows every hill and stream. In the busy life of the fort, schooling for the children is not neglected. A clay-floored cabin serves as a classroom where elementary lessons are provided for youngsters of widely varying ages. What letter is this? A. Now for another letter, but first the A, drawn with charcoal, must be erased. Perhaps the next letter will not be quite so easy. What letter is this? B. There seems to be a difference of opinion. R. 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 Meanwhile, in the Carter cabin, household tasks proceed. Mrs. Carter is busy at her loom, weaving cloth strips into floor mats, while Mrs. Taylor takes up a kettle of melted tallow from before the cooking fire, tallow she uses for pouring candles in a metal mold. We'll need those candles for the big doing Saturday night. They'll be ready. Yes, the candles will be needed Saturday night. And Saturday night, they're ready. The candles are ready. The chicken fixings too. And the corn doings too. All hands up and swing right. I says to him, stranger, why them ain't the Indian mounds you're looking at. Them's tater heads. Little old tater heads. The days go by, and soon Taylor is felling trees from his own land for his own log cabin. As the trees are felled, John carefully trims them, while nearby, friends proceed with the work of fitting trimmed logs into the rapidly growing cabin. And as new logs are made ready, they're carried to the builders, while Henry, the faithful Taylor slave, continues with the tree cutting. Yes, Taylor owns land now. 170 acres, and soon he'll have a new home. But before the cabin is finished, the walls must be carefully chinked with chips of wood and good firm clay. With this task, too, friends help. As the cabin nears completion, Henry begins plowing the Taylor land in preparation for the planting of the first corn crop. The plow is new to this soil, and it brings the promise of a richer, freer life. At last, the day arrives when the tailors are ready to leave the temporary haven of the fort to establish themselves in their new frontier home. Goodbye. Bye. They go forth alone, but they travel toward the freedom that is their goal. Darkness is beginning to envelop the Kentucky hills and forests as the tailors complete their journey. But now, they are home. They are on land that is theirs, and theirs alone. And with land, a man can be free. Presently, as the smoke from their fireplace rises against the evening sky, the tailors, proud and secure in their pioneer faith, 
face the radiant west that beckons still. If things don't go right, we can always move on. Let's not think about that. Not yet. No, but it's good to know there'll always be freedom out there. Freedom out there always.